Hello, folks. Scott Guile from McMillan. We will get to Jonathan in a moment. I just wanted to thank you for signing up for this and coming today. I think it's going to be a great talk. Quickly, I know some of you probably don't use GoToWebinar all the time. A review of what you're seeing on your screen. In the top right corner of your screen, you should see this orange arrow. You can click on that orange arrow and it pops out some functions for you. If you're having issues with audio or want to switch up audio, if you click on that little carrot or chevron or whatever that is to the left of the audio, you'll have some audio options. The other option you have is questions. You can ask anything you want to us during the course of this webinar. There will also be a dedicated QA. Because of the number of people signed up, you are muted. We do want to hear from you. So please ask us any questions using this question functionality. It comes to us all. If you want to make the question functionality bigger, this little square will pop it into the middle of your screen and make it somewhat easier to work with. Secondly, for GoToWebinar, if you're not seeing the screen at any point in time, there is a little blue flower icon. I guess if you have a Mac, it's an orange flower icon in the same shape at the bottom of your computer in what people often call the tray. If you click on that, it maximizes and minimizes the presentation. You will not close it this way. This is just a maximizer and a minimizer. We're thrilled to have Jonathan Mooney here today. He's been a delight to work with. He is an award-winning writer, entrepreneur, activist. He uh, a lot of his writing and his research details is uh, his difficulty learning to read and his struggles learning as a child, which he overcame and attended an Ivy League university and wrote a book at age 23. He has won several awards and gotten several fellowships. Um, I, I'm pretty sure Joe Bean is not the president, so I think I made a copy and paste there. My bad. He shared this stage with Vice President Joe Biden. That's uh, uh, public service for doing better proofreading on your slides when you're busy. I apologize. It is Joe Biden. Um, he has been featured in several different outlets, HBO, NPR, New York Times, NBC, et cetera, et cetera. And with no further ado, I will pass things over to Jonathan to get us started. Well, uh, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Jonathan Mooney, and I'm uh, just really honored and uh, privileged to be spending some time with y'all today virtually. Now, uh, before I do my thing, just a, a few pieces of, of housekeeping, uh, if you'll bear with me. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to reiterate what Scott had to say about how I want to spend our time together. Uh, you know, I read recently that the average human attention span, the average human attention span is about uh, 15 minutes. Uh, and then I read that the average attention span of somebody on a, a, a virtual conference <laughs> about 18 months into a global pandemic is about 15 seconds, right? <laughs> so I want to assure you all that uh, I'm going to respect that research, uh, keep my uh, talking at you down to a manageable minimum and make sure that we have uh, ample time to talk together in the form of questions, conversation, and dialogue. So I want to reiterate what Scott said, which is please be empowered uh, during my prepared remarks to put any questions, any comments, uh, any reflections into the uh, Q&A feature of this uh, GoToWebinar platform. And we will use those uh, at the conclusion of my presentation uh, as a way to uh, talk together uh, virtually. So I hope that sounds like, like an okay way to spend some time together today. Now, second piece of uh, housekeeping here, I just wanna uh, give a, a big old shout out to, to the folks at Macmillan broadly uh, and Macmillan Learning specifically. Uh, you know, I'm honored to have uh, two of my three books published by Macmillan, uh, books that deal with issues of inclusion uh, for folks with atypical brains and bodies and, and issues that uh, deal with social justice uh, for folks who have been left behind. And I know Macmillan has a deep commitment uh, to making the world a more inclusive and just place. Uh, I know that on the publishing side, but I also know that from Scott and his team within Macmillan Learning. 
So I want to give a shout out to them. Uh, obviously, uh, thank you, Scott, and your team for the opportunity to be here. But more importantly, thanks for the work that you do every day to make learning inclusive and accessible, not just for some young people, some learners, but ultimately all. Okay, with all that said and done, uh, <laughs> housekeeping out of the way, uh, let me get right to it. You know, uh, I'm, I'm here with you all today virtually uh, to talk about how we can empower uh, marginalized learners uh, with neurodiversities. And I'll be real with you all, um, that's a very personal conversation uh, for me. Uh, it's a personal conversation because, you know, I was one of those marginalized neurodiverse learners who, as a result of those differences, struggled tremendously in school. You know, I was the proverbial uh, square peg that did not fit the round hole of American education. Uh, I was the kid who had such a hard time sitting still that I spent a lot of the day uh, chilling out with the custodian in the hallway, right? <laughs> I was the kid who, uh, surprise, surprise, had a really hard time keeping his mouth shut. So uh, I ended up on a first name basis with Shirley, the receptionist in the principal's office. <laughs> and I was also the kid um, who had a really hard time with reading a and specifically a torturous time with reading out loud. So uh, I spent a lot of the day uh, hiding in the bathroom to escape reading out loud with tears uh, streaming down my face. Uh, as Scott mentioned, um, I didn't learn to read until I was 12. Couldn't read until I was 12. Uh, growing up, uh, I had every label you could imagine. You know, I was called the lazy kid. Uh, I was called the bad kid, the at-risk kid. And then eventually I became the special ed kid. Uh, I was diagnosed with a continuum of language-based learning differences, dyslexia, dysgraphia, and others, right around third grade. I was diagnosed with a whole bunch of executive functioning and behavior problems, ADHD, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, and others, uh, right around fifth grade. And uh, I ended up leaving school, uh, dropping out, for about a year in sixth grade. Uh, that year when I uh, left school, I struggled with a number of mental health challenges. I struggled with depression, I struggled with uh, anxiety, and I had a plan for uh, suicide. So I'm sure y'all can imagine, uh, by the time I got sort of back in school, uh, middle school and beyond, there were all sorts of low expectations that surrounded me. Uh, low expectations that uh, too often surround and constrain that square peg that <laughs> doesn't fit the the round hole. You know, I heard it all, right? Uh, I was told by my, my dad one day that I would probably be a high school dropout. Uh, I was told by a counselor once that I would uh, never have a job, be unemployed. Uh, and then I was told one day uh, by a teacher that I would most likely end up in jail or incarcerated. So I was asked here today with you all virtually to share with you how I went on a very different journey than the one predicted for me. You know, opposed to being a um, high school uh, dropout, as my father thought, you know, I became a, a college graduate. Uh, as Scott mentioned, I, I graduated from Brown University, uh, which I'm sure many of you know is an Ivy League university. And I graduated uh, from Brown with a honors degree in, of all things, English literature, right? <laughs> now, opposed to uh, uh, being unemployed, as that counselor said, I ended up uh, writing books, uh, three of them. The uh, first book, as Scott mentioned, I wrote as an undergraduate at Brown when I was uh, 21 years old. And most importantly, you know, what I am uh, most proud of, opposed to being an inmate, you know, I became a advocate somebody who has uh, dedicated his entire professional life, about 21 years, uh, trying to make the world a better place for that square peg 
that doesn't fit the round hole and gets the short end of the stick because of that. So I want to share with you all um, what made a difference for me, you know, but more importantly, uh, I want to share with you all what makes a difference for learners like me, B because you all know that uh, I'm not alone. There's a lot of uh, square pegs out there <laughs> who struggle in traditional education and who, when things are done differently, can persevere and thrive ultimately in life. So I want to share three things with y'all before we open it up uh, to talk together in the form of questions and conversation that I know you can do um, as an administrator, as a classroom teacher, uh, as a uh, support professional, and everything in between. Three things you can do uh, to facilitate a journey of change and transformation for that young person who lives and learns differently. So let me start first and foremost uh, with what, in my life at least, um, but what I also know in the research literature is the first step towards change for young folks who learn outside the lines. Change, uh, inclusion, and ultimately social justice for those folks requires us to reframe who or what we call the problem. You know, for most of uh, human history, uh, we have called normal good and right. And if you deviate from that statistical construct of normality or average, if you don't fit the middle of the uh, distribution bell curve, you get the message that you are not different, but deficient. You are called the problem. You know, a philosopher I admire uh, named Michel Foucault uh, once wrote that the judges of normality are ever present everywhere. And those judges rule too many of us out and put the problem inside the person with a difference. You know, I know that in my own life, you know, a naturally occurring series of variations in learnings, brain, and body are turned into deficiencies inside of people. You know, many neurodiverse come into their sense of self through being diagnosed. Hang out with that word right there, right? Diagnosis in and of itself implies finding and diagnosing a problem inside of people. It's a pathology lens that sees different as deficient. I know that personally, right? I remember when, when I was diagnosed and the school psychologist called me and my mom into her office to give us the test results back. And the moment me and my mom walked into that office, it was obvious <laughs> that everybody in that room thought we were getting the worst news ever, right? You know, the lights were turned down low. <laughs> there was a soft jazz music playing in the background. There was a box of tissues on the table <laughs> because everybody in that room thought that we were there to mourn the death of my normality. And folks proceeded to read from that diagnosis about my language processing deficits, my attention deficit disorder, my executive functioning problems. And I walked out of that room and I said, hey, Ma, what's wrong with me? We make different deficient. And as a result, young folks, the one in five folks who are neurodiverse grow up feeling deficient, that they are a problem. But the reality is, you know, those folks in that room, hey, hey they got the uh, diagnosis wrong. <laughs> the problem wasn't me. The problem wasn't these neurodiversities. The problem was the way difference was treated in learning environments designed around the myth that we should all be 
the same. You know, ADD, not, not, not my problem. You know, it's a difference. Look, I, I, I'm not naive about the challenges that come with my neurodiversity. I struggle with paying attention. I, I have the attention span of a gnat, right? <laughs> I struggle with uh, executive functioning and organization. I have explored the feasibility of stapling my car keys to my forehead, right? I get that. <laughs> Those are very real challenges, but they're challenges, not inherent deficits or disorders. When I was growing up, my problem wasn't ADD, but the school desk. How in God's name can a school desk be a kid's problem? Well, let me immerse you for a moment into my relationship with the school desk, and it is a fraught relationship, right? You know, for some young folks, the, the school desk is a benign piece of school furniture. For me, the school desk might as well be a form of enhanced interrogation that would make Dick Cheney proud, right? <laughs> this is my experience at the school desk. First grade, Brown University, today, doesn't matter. Five seconds in the class, my foot's bouncing. 10 seconds in the class, both feet are bouncing. 15 seconds in the class, Oh, I'm the kid who's going to start rocking the drums, right? 15 minutes in the class, I'm the kid who's trying to take his leg and put it behind his neck, right? And young folks are constantly shamed for that because we have a set of cultural norms that are institutionalized in pedagogical practices that confuses or conflates being good with being compliant. And if you aren't the compliant kid that raises their hand and keeps their mouth shut and sits still, something's wrong with you. You know, I got that message at home every night at the dinner table with my dad. Hey, Jonathan, stop it, stop it, stop it. What's wrong with you? And I got that message in uh, some of my classrooms growing up. N not all of them. Don't, don't get me wrong, y'all. But, but many of them. You know, I'll never forget I had a, a teacher in second grade named Mrs. C. Hey, I've had many, many gifted, brilliant teachers in my life who I will celebrate with you today. Mrs. C is not one of those, right? <laughs> my foot would be bouncing. She would stop class. She would point at me. All the kids would look at me and she would say at the top of her lungs, Jonathan, what is your problem? We put the problem in the person but the truth is the problem ain't me problem ain't add the problem is the passive learning environment where on average young folks spend about 75 percent of the day sitting still passively receiving information the problem is the confusion and conflation of good and compliant and ultimately the problem is the shame and social stigma it comes from being publicly called a problem. Hey, that's really the problem. Problem's not in the person, but the interaction of difference and environment built for the myth that we're all the same. And the same is true with my so-called learning problems, right? You know, dyslexia, dysgraphia, you know, those words, again, uh, imply that there's something inherently wrong with, with my brain. A and the brains of the one in five out there who learn differently but the reality is you know um this thing is, is is really a difference you know again it's a difference with challenges and i want to be clear about that you know look i i uh spell at a third grade level <laughs> i spell i spell at a, a third grade level right god god bless spell check you know uh, <laughs> i struggle with reading to this day uh, my phonetic awareness is in the 12th percentile. Y'all know that I confuse words that look alike. To, to this day, right, who and how look the same to me. A uh, horse and house uh, look the same to me. I, I swear to y'all, when I went to uh, Brown University, uh, I thought that Brown offered a course in orgasmic chemistry, okay? <laughs> Imagine uh my disappointment <laughs> on the first day of that class, right? So, hey, I get it. Those are very real challenges, but it's not my problem. It's my difference. My problem was being made to feel stupid 
because I learned differently. You know, we got a uh, very narrow definition of what constitutes intelligence in our culture. You know, we privilege certain brains over other brains. We confuse or conflate, you know, being good at school with being smart. You know, the good student sits still, reads well, writes well, and does a series of academic tasks with proficiency. But I'm sure you all know that that leaves so many people out. D don't know about y'all, but, but let me tell you, in my life, in my life, some of the smartest people I have ever met didn't read well didn't write well, didn't do school well, but guess what? They could rebuild the car engine from scratch. And that person is just as intelligent and valuable as that person with a 4.0, but that ain't the message we give young folks growing up. If you don't got that one brain, something's wrong with you, you know, you're dumb. And not only do we uh, give that message uh, implicitly, but it's explicitly institutionalized in our education system because if you don't got that academic brain you find yourself in the dumb group i'm sure y'all i'm sure y'all know the dumb group right i'm sure many of y'all went to educational experiences that had reading groups right let me ask you a question about those reading groups was it ever hard to tell which reading group was the smart group and which reading group was the uh dumb group not hard to tell right <laughs> you got the blackbirds over here you got the bluebirds over here and then over in the annex trailer building you got the sparrows you know come on now <laughs> we ain't fooling anybody let me put it this way when i was growing up everybody knew that my group was the dumb group because my group was a bird that did not fly right <laughs> it was a ostrich and it ran quickly you know and everybody knew that the condors were the smart group because my group was reading c spot run and the condors were reading war and peace right <laughs> and everybody knows you know we all know what gets you in the smart group we've all been acculturated in a privileging of certain brains over others what gets you in the smart group ain't your tactile kinesthetic intelligence <laughs> It ain't your social emotional IQ. It ain't your ability to talk, build, draw, write, create, or connect to other human beings. It's a narrow band of academic skills. And that narrow definition of intelligence, that narrow definition of the normal learner, it leaves so many people out and it wounds so many people deeply. And that's the problem, not learning differently. So the problem's not in the person with the difference. It's in the context around the person. And reframing, re-diagnosing the problem matters. It matters for individual learners deeply. I learned too late in my life that I wasn't the problem. I struggled tremendously with self-harm, with feeling I had no future, because I thought I was defective. But I had individual educators in my life throughout my journey in the K-12 system, in higher education, who challenged that message for me, who helped me understand that different wasn't deficient. That's you. Be that person in the life of somebody who reframes the problem. Organize mentorship programs that share the stories of other folks who learn differently, celebrating their differences. Represent this journey in curriculum and in the literature and stories that we tell. Different isn't deficient. Intentional activities to help me unlearn the idea that I'm defective is the first step towards change. But it's not the last. I told you there were three things, you know, let me talk about the second one. Because when we think differently about folks who learn and live differently, we can then act differently towards them. And it's that acting differently that is the second thing that made a difference for me. You know, when we put the problem in the person, what do we try to do? Fix the person, right? You know, we have a long history of trying to re re rehabilitate and remediate difference. 
fix the person. Make the square peg fit the round hole. But the problem is when we make the peg fit the hole, when we fix, fix, fix somebody, sometimes they break. We have to reject that problem in the person, fix the person approach, and replace it with something else. And that something else uh, was represented first in my life by my mom, right? Wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Colleen Mooney, you know? <laughs> Let me give you a mental image of her, you know? My mom, not a tall woman. Uh, on a good day, in high heels, on her tippy toes, my mom is 4'11", right? L little Irish bulldog, you know? And my mom's got a very uh, high-pitched, squeaky voice like Minnie Mouse. She totally sounds like Minnie Mouse. And my mother, she uh, curses like a truck driver. So let me ask you all a uh, rhetorical question. If you were a principal, if you were a teacher, did you want cursing Minnie Mouse in your face? <laughs> the answer to that question, if you were at all confused, is no. But guess where my mom was every single day when things were going wrong for me? Oh, she was in that office. How did we know <laughs> she was in that office? Well, we knew she was in that office because every dog in the neighborhood was running away. <laughs> Only bats could hear her high-pitched obscenities. Glass was shattering. My mom understood something intuitively, you know. She understood that I didn't need somebody in my life to fix me. What I needed was somebody to fight for my right to learn differently. And that's a fundamentally different path. Problems not in the person, problems in the environment around the person. So our work together is to change the environment to include folks who learn differently. That's your work every single day, to move away from remediation to accommodation. I'm here with you all today because my struggles with sitting still were accommodated. I, I remember a teacher in my life at Brown named Tamar Katz, a PhD, a postmodern literature expert. And I walked into day one of her class and in the back of her classroom, or a set of clipboards. And she told the whole class, hey, if, if you don't sit still well, go to the back of the room, pace back and forth, and take your notes walking and moving because moving is related to learning. What a revelation. Not sit still, raise your hand, but accommodate opposed to remediate. I'll tell you I'm here because of accommodations uh, around uh, my writing challenges. Hey, hey, if you, uh, uh, you know, spell at a third grade level and your handwriting sucks, <laughs> you dumb it down, right? Because you don't want to seem, seem dumb. You know, when I was growing up, I would only ever write in class paragraphs or sentences with the words that I could find on posters in the room. And if I couldn't find a way to write a paragraph or sentence with the words, on the dare poster in the back of the room, what would I do? Well, I would scribble it or write monosyllabic sentences because I didn't want people to think I was dumb. But then guess what? They thought I was dumb. And then I thought I was dumb and I was in a dumb it down cycle, which was broken by a teacher, professor in college who said, Jonathan, you can talk out your ideas. I can do that. This professor said, Human beings have been talking out their ideas throughout all of human history. Yeah, you could do that. And they connected me to speech to text accommodations. And nowadays we got uh, that accommodation in our pockets on our phones. And I'm here with you because of the accommodation around my reading challenges. You know, back in my day, it was books on tape, right? Thing was so big, you had to put it into a backpack and plug it into a generator, right? And then you had Stephen Hawking in your ear all day long. Nowadays, we got the world's literature and libraries on our phones, in our pockets, creating access to information that's at somebody's interest level opposed to their reading level. Accommodate opposed to remediate. Fix the environment, not the person. But my challenge for you 
is to not stop at accommodating some learners, but ultimately accommodating all learners. Because right now, when we mediate accommodation with diagnosis, right, the only folks that get differentiated instruction are the people who have a problem, we pathologize and reinforce the problematization of difference. Because the reality is the only normal learner is a learner you don't know very well. <laughs> we are all on a continuum of learning diversity. And these interventions to the environment that have historically been limited for folks with diagnoses should be accessible to all. Because we all, at different times, for different reasons, learn differently. So our work is not to accommodate some, accommodate all. Our work is to use the construct of accommodation to start advancing the bold idea of universal design of instruction. The idea that we can build learning environments that don't just work for some learners, but ultimately work for all learners. Okay, I got one more for you, and I'll cover it real quick so we can talk together, right? Three things made a difference for me. Different isn't efficient. Redefine the problem. Don't fix the person, change the environment. Accommodate, opposed to remediate, but ultimately think about universal design of instruction. And last but not least, you know, equity, empowerment, and inclusion for folks with neurodiversity requires us to challenge the deficit model that surrounds these young folks. You know, if you're a kid like me, uh, you hear all about, you know, what you can't do. You know, I, I know I did, you know, Jonathan can't sit still, Jonathan can't spell, Jonathan can't read, Jonathan can't, can't, can't. The thing you don't hear much about is what you can do, right? It's that deficit model that has its historical origins in making different deficient. So let's categorize all the uh, deficiencies with inside this person. And it's deeply embedded in our language and in our systems. You know, nothing embodies that institutionalization of the deficit model better, uh, at least in my journey, uh, than the IEP. I I'm sure you all know uh, an IEP. An IEP is an individualized education plan for those that don't know it. Got to be real about that thing. NSA, KGB got nothing on the IEP, right? <laughs> They've been doing deep intel on me my whole life, flying unmanned drone missions over my house. And it ain't good news in that file. Research shows clearly for every one strength in the file, whether it be a 504 plan, IEP, response to intervention plan, uh, assessment uh, of an incoming freshman at university, whatever it may be, all of those files, for every one strength, there's upwards of 25 weaknesses, deficits and disorders. Deficit model it has to be challenged head on because nobody thrives in life of seeing themselves solely through a lens of what's wrong with them. And I know the power of having that deficit ch model challenge in my own journey, right? You know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a, a teacher named Mr. R, you know. This man had a ferocious commitment to the idea that everybody had some right with him. And he saw his job as an educator to be surfacing the strengths in every single learning learner. And he would ask every kid every day, hey, what are you good at, you know? And uh, he'd ask me that question. And because I was in IEP land, <laughs> hearing all about what was wrong with me, my answer to him would be, Mr. R, I ain't good at anything, man. Nothing, you know. But the thing is, he never gave up. And uh, one day he came to me. And he said, hey, Jonathan, uh, I've been watching you. And you are wrong about yourself. You are so good at telling stories. Now, sometimes they're inappropriate stories you tell, <laughs> but I don't care. You are so good at telling stories that you could be a writer. I was nine when he said that to me. Nobody had ever said anything like that to me before. I said, Mr. R, a writer? You, you really think that I could be a writer? Are you out of your goddamn mind, I said. 
I can't spell, man. And the guy looked right at me and he said, hey, Jonathan, in my class, screw spelling. Screw spelling, man, yeah. You should have seen me just jump out of my body because for the first time in somebody in my life, said, forget what you can't do and focus on what you can do. And that was a, a, a revelation in my sense of self and a revolution in my education. Research y'all is clear, according to the Gallup organization. When young folks believe that an educator in their life knows their strengths and talents, they are 70 eight percent more engaged in the act of learning and the reality is the neurodiverse have so many strengths gifts and talents not despite their neurodiversity they have these strengths gifts and talents because of their neurodiversity we know that entrepreneurship and problem solving go hand in hand with anxiety and attentional differences. We know that creativity goes hand in hand with language processing challenges and differences. We know that there are strengths and talents not despite, but because. And those folks who thrive in life, they don't fix what's wrong with them. They accommodate their challenges through teams, technology, and help, and they build on their strengths, gifts, and talents. And that's something that every single learner deserves. Okay, so I want to conclude, you know, and in concluding, I want to come back to, you know, what this work is all about. You know, that square peg, so many are left behind, left out, marginalized by a narrow definition of what constitutes the normal learner. That idea of the normal human emerged within a cultural context of industrialization and standardization in which there was a cultural imperative to make folks more the same, opposed to celebrate what makes them different. And that idea of a normal human being, it's been used to disqualify, to dehumanize entire swaths of human beings, black and brown folks, LGBTQ plus folks, economically marginalized individuals, individuals with atypical brains and bodies and everything in between, it's got to go. Reality is our differences are what constitutes our humanity. And our work together is about fighting for every single human being's right to be different. Okay, with all that said and done, uh, thank you for listening to me talk at you. Uh, now we'll turn to the talk together part of our time. I know Scott and his team have been following your questions and will pose those to me. I also want to let you know uh, that I'm going to give my email address when we're all done. So if you have a question that you don't want to ask in this format, which I totally get, you can hit me up personally on my email and we'll go from there. So Scott, um, the, the floor, as they say, is yours, man. Thank you, Jonathan. That was wonderful. Uh, you guys can see my screen okay? I'm on, man. Yeah, I can see it. Yep. Excellent. Little known fact, I didn't share this. But I was actually a special ed teacher for six years. So yes, I, I relate to some of uh, a lot of what you just shared there. We're going to get to the QA in a moment. Questions are rolling in. I wanted to briefly share, Jonathan mentioned our shared vision. We're rolling out a new courseware system and we're trying to bake in the tools to allow educators to reach all of their learners. The first thing that we've done is we put a ton of content, different kinds of content in here. I'm not going to get into unpacking content here, but that's one of our, our missions is to give people the tools they need to reach different types of learners. The other thing we've done is we provided an insight and reporting dashboard that allows you to track students who may be at risk. You can apply these insight widgets to any of and all of your work that you assign within the platform. And this would allow you to identify students who may need help, that may need extra attention, that may need alternative strategies earlier than if you didn't have these tools. 
Last but not least, something that we've done recently, which I absolutely love, we've got these goal setting and reflection surveys that can be assigned to any students in any class. We've had Dev English to Organic Chem instructors assign these and be very successful with them. And they allow students to take uh, responsibility and accountability for their own work by simply assigning five different surveys. The surveys give the students an idea of Here's some sample questions. What are you hoping to learn in this class? Are there skills you're hoping to walk away with? On how average, how many hours do you expect to spend in this class outside of lecture? What makes you confident or doubtful of your ability to do well in this course? That's the intro survey. And then there's follow up surveys that check in on students. Are they meeting their goals? Are they falling behind? Do they need to make changes? The student response to these surveys has been overwhelmingly good. And these are uh, part and parcel of every Achieve course that, uh, that we're putting out. But enough from me on that. This is, again, um, you know, Jonathan's talk sponsored by Macmillan Learning, but we want to get back to Jonathan because we do have a lot of questions. So I'm going to kick it off with, I'm just going to go from the one that came in first and take it from there. What advice would you give? Okay, move down because I got another one. Let's try that again. What advice would you give to instructors who are told not to accommodate students unless the student has a school issued accommodation letter slash plan? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Um, it really gets to the to the heart of you know that 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 shift that uh, I I and others are trying to advocate uh, around universal design and not having accommodations mediated by diagnosis. Uh, before I answer the sort of specific uh, what to do of that question, let me just, if I can, elaborate just a little bit on how problematic mediating accommodation with diagnosis is. Uh, obviously, for the social emotional reasons that I articulated, you know, being quote unquote diagnosed um, carries stigma, carries um, uh, uh, sort of self pathologizing um, and that's challenging for folks trying to extricate themselves from that that deficit model uh, over the course of their life um, it's also an, an issue of um, economic equality because um, in many parts of the country getting diagnosed costs ten thousand dollars you know our school is supposed to do it, sure, but the waiting lists at the average public school can be over a year. So we have um, a real issue of, of economic um, injustice going on when we mediate differentiated instruction with diagnosis or plan. Uh, I know that's out of y'all's control, you know, because uh, you're not setting the policy for the institution, um, but I wanna just name that and 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 articulate that and surface that so that uh, folks who uh, encounter those barriers can go off to be advocates against it. What's the solution to that big system problem? Well, the solution is to is to make the Office of Disability Support Services the Office of Universal Design of Instruction. That's the systemic solution. Uh, have the accessible technologies that we know work for folks on uh, the continuum that of difference that we've called disability accessible for all you know look who uses the ramps that were mandated by the ada um, to create access to buildings folks with mobility assistance of course but but folks pushing strollers too uh, or pushing uh, a shopping cart right it's an access it's a it's an accessibility uh, intervention to the environment that has broad ramifications beyond the folks who experience disability in a formal sense. So I, I know I'm preaching to the choir in some ways, but but the choir needs preaching too, and I think that's important to articulate. So with that said, the very specific experience, you know, I, I've been told not to accommodate unless there's a, um, a formal diagnosis or plan. Well, um, there are a lot of informal accommodations that one can do. Um, that fly under the radar a little bit, you know. Um, accommodations to create active learning environments, right? I, I talked about that Tamar Katz, um, who who facilitated that 
by essentially empowering students to, to, to pace if they needed to. You know, that didn't cost any money. That didn't require a lot of permission. Uh, there's a lot of active learning accommodations that can be put in place that, for lack of a better word, kind of fly under the radar that are universally designed and can be impactful for everyone. You know, encouraging a young person to engage with um, uh, accessible technology, you know, like depending on the smartphone that they have, like you can do speech to text, text to speech, and not need any um, mediation by by an official department. You used to have to have your 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 text-based work translated by the Office of Disability Support Services, but that's not the case anymore. So I think there's a lot of those sort of like, hey, uh, let's not tell folks we're doing this and do it, to, to be frank with you, that will create a more accessible and inclusive environment. Now, if there are a set of needs, such as assessment accommodations, right? I know that's a big one. It was a big one for me. Time extensions on assessments made a huge difference for me. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know why. If you read in the 12th percentile, it, it takes you longer to do the test, right? And it ain't fair that you have the same amount of time as other folks. Like that's just sort of fair as an equal all the time, right? But nonetheless, some of those bigger accommodations require systemic approval. Um, you could encourage uh, young people to seek out um, a diagnosis as a tool to help them get the accommodations that they need. Um, depending upon where you are uh, in the country, there's varying levels of, of um, infrastructure to facilitate low cost uh, assessment. Um, if you email me afterwards, you know, I can kind of maybe point you in the direction depending upon where you are who asked that question. But you can link folks to that world, um, not in a negative way, not in a like, oh, hey, something's wrong with you, but you can say, look, you know, you learn differently. You can get an assessment that helps you understand what, what you're good at. Good at. Because these assessments that lead to diagnosis, the other side of the coin is that they give a whole strength profile, if done right. And they also give you a sense of what's hard for you. And, uh, and then the, the, the institution can work better for you. So you can facilitate a conversation about di diagnosis or assessment, I like that word better, um, that isn't negative, uh, that's actually empowering. Because you know it's helpful for me, um, being dyslexic is better than being stupid, <laughs> you know, in my own mind. Uh, the problem is we don't uh, tell the other side of the story, which is, yeah, you struggle with reading, but, but you also are really good at this. And it's not despite being dyslexic, it's because, right? So that's the dialogue that we want to create. And I think you can facilitate assessment in a very positive way that is an act of empowerment by having a, a direct conversation with that student or with that learner. Yeah, I think we have a number of other questions. I'll just quickly say, in my career as a special educator, I gave a lot of these assessments and looked at them. And neurodiverse students tend to be very spiky in their assessments. Yeah. So it is yeah. easy to identify strengths because they're very spiky. It's not just you're low in this, there's corresponding highs. Let me get to the yeah. next question. Do you have any strategies or exercises that could be used in class to identify individual strengths and talents of neurodivergent students? So kind of a yeah. good segue. Thank you for that question. And, th and thank you for a, for a commitment to trying to actualize and operationalize a, a, a paradigm shift for young people. So let me give you a very, very practical resource. Um, and this resource is free of cost. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, a platform called Thrive.ly. It's the word Thrive, L-Y. So Thrive.ly.com. Uh, and Thrive We provides a comprehensive strength assessment for learners. And then it captures that strength assessment in a portfolio so that uh, it can that can be shared. You know, it can be shared with the student, uh, it can be shared with other colleagues, it can be shared with, uh, I know that this is a mostly higher education environment, uh, but in the K-12 system, uh, it can be shared with parents. It's a powerful tool to challenge that deficit model and help people rebuild that sense of self um, that costs you nothing. So it's Thrively, the word Thrive, L-Y dot com, Thrively dot com. And I can also tell you that's a very practical uh, tool. There's a, there's a, a, a symbiotic relationship 
to that notion of redefining the problem and then also challenging deficits, th those are one and the same, right? And uh, that strength assessment goes a long way in helping a young person um, say, you know what, you know, maybe they got the diagnosis wrong. Or to Scott's really, really smart point, um, uh, they didn't share the whole diagnosis because Scott's right, like these things are spiky and it would have been very easy for that those people in that room when we were mourning the death of my normality, it would have been very easy for them to just point out the spikes first, right? And then talk about the challenges because we're not here to deny the challenges, those are real, but we're here to have a nuanced conversation. So it seems like uh, uh, perhaps there's also a, a strength-based resource within the McMillan's learning platform that I was unaware of. So if that's the case, Scott, jump right in because that, that'll be another yeah. resource that I'll point people to when I'm asked that question. Quickly, I got, I, we got a lot of questions, so just a, a quick moment. Uh, you mentioned uh, active learning. Our learning science department, which we do put a lot of resource into, identified active learning as probably the most effective way to teach a, a, a large body of students. and. Based on that research, we did instructor activity guides for active learning for every single title that we put into Achieve. For instance, there's 28 in this one. I'm not going to unpack them right now. I just want to point it out and get to the next question. But yes, the active learning thing is something we put a lot of resource into because we found that uh, the learning science research was showing us it is um, it, it's very effective. Yeah, so, let me just uh, say one thing before we get to that next question on active learning. So I, I talked about active learning in a very um, sort of narrow sense of of facilitating, you know, uh, like movement or whatnot. But the highest aspiration of active learning is experiential and project-based learning. Um, so we're replacing a sort of move and do, I mean, a, a sit and get environment, you know, sit still and get information to a move and do environment. So any um, course guides that are grounded in trying to um, have experiential inquiry-based learning is the highest manifestation of active learning. And the research is clear um, across the board that that improves engagement, it improves uh, retention of information, uh, not just for the learners who are quote unquote at risk learners, but ultimately for all learners. It's one of the key um, in universal design strategies that I advocate for and believe deeply in. Absolutely. It takes some effort, but it, our research uh, concurs with that. So next question. I'm a tutor at a college. I have had no education on neuro neurodivergent learners, but I came into contact with these types of learners regularly and felt terrible at my lack of knowledge and ability to provide solutions out of the normal tools I have. Are there resources that I could look into to help me learn how to help them as well as any resources just to educate myself? Uh, I think you sort of answered that with the Thrively, but maybe anything to add to that? Uh -oh. Jonathan, can you hear us? You are, I, I think I was cut off for a moment here too. So you I, was saying, moment. You're, you're back. I was saying to the, to the questioner, I was saying, be, be kind to yourself because, you know, you're not alone in, in not getting adequate information about uh, neurodiversity uh, or even pedagogy. I mean, if we think about the um, training for higher education professionals, um, it's about content, you know, opposed to uh, learning and, and pedagogy. And that's not uh, the individual's fault. That's a systemic flaw in the way that we have thought about um, learning and and higher education specifically so be kind to yourself you know this, this isn't about pointing fingers at anybody um, and this isn't about throwing anyone under the bus it's to say um, we know more now and so what do we do so in that in that goal of of trying to continue to do right by neurodivergent learners a good resource is is a is a website called understood um, just like the word understood understood.org um, it's got um, a, a wonderful resource library uh, around uh, sort of um, pedagogical approaches uh, for the continuum of, of learners um, that's a that's a, a wonderful free resource um, I wrote uh, my first book 
a book called Learning Outside the Lines as an undergraduate in college, co-authored with a um, another undergraduate who I met as, as a transfer to Brown, he transferred to, who had a, a comparable journey to me for different reasons. And that book was, was designed to be a guide, really. It's, it's unlike my, my other two books, that that's a very practical book. Um, and um, I know that, that a lot of folks in the sort of student support world have, have leaned on that book as a way to kind of uh, teach different for folks who learn different. And, um, and so that's a, that's a resource that I would put out there running outside the lines and then understood is a free website, understood.org. Thank you, Jonathan. It looks like we have time for one more question. Do you want to give your email address out? Because we're not going to get to all the questions. And yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll include it in the follow-up as well, if that's okay with you. But maybe just give it here. Yeah, of course. So uh, my email address is Jonathan Mooney. It's uh, one word, lowercase. Uh, it's J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N. Jonathan Mooney at me.com. Scott and his team have it and, and we'll send it out. I welcome all questions, uh, any questions. I also want to say this, you know, um, uh, I've been taking advantage of the, the Zoom uh, slash distance uh, technology um, to give free presentations to anyone who's on a comparable mission that I and Scott and his team are on. Um, so if that's you, you know, and, and you got some students you work with or class or whatnot, um, uh, write me and and uh, we'll, we'll make it happen. Um, so questions are welcomed as well as opportunities to to continue to amplify this work of neurodiversity and inclusion. Because I have to say in this moment of, of uh, talking seriously as a culture and country about equity and inclusion, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, Folks with atypical brains and bodies are left out of that conversation. Um, we think about it through the lens of, of disability support services opposed to disability as a form of diversity. And so if, if that's your jam and you're all about it and I can come in and support uh, that in your local context, um, count me in. So hit me an email. So Scott, I know we got two minutes. Um, um, I'm going to pass it off to you, but, but, but thanks again to uh, Macmillan Learning, uh, you know, a deep commitment. I, I wouldn't be doing this, frankly, if it wasn't for um, their commitment to using their tool and platform to build accessible learning environments. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm inspired by that, and I appreciate the opportunity to partner with them today. Thank you, Jonathan, and it's been a, it's been our pleasure. It really has. Thank you for doing this for us. Sorry, we're out of time, folks. There are questions we didn't get to. I hate when that happens, but uh, we, we only have the space for an hour uh, and someone else is going to end up needing to use it. At any rate, we will be sending the recording of this to you. Someone asked if they could use it in their class. Yes, you may. Of course. We'll be sending it to you probably within a couple of days, hopefully by Friday, Monday at the latest. You can share it out with others as well. Uh, we will, with Jonathan's permission, include his email address in the follow-up. So if people want to continue this conversation, they will have the ability to do so uh, directly to Jonathan. Thank you all for coming. This is a super important topic. To uh, I mean, this has been a part of my professional life, not just at Macmillan. And by the way, I have a, a child who has Down syndrome as well. So very important topic for me and for many of us. So we appreciate your, your interest and, and your advocacy of it. Thank you guys. Have a great night or day. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.